Welcome to another question and answer video. In this video, I'll be dealing with the issue of Calvinism. Uh, I've recently received a couple of questions regarding election and predestination, so I thought it'd be good to go ahead and make a video showing from the Word of God how that the five points of Calvinism are wrong. Now, Calvinism is a system of theology named after its chief proponent, John Calvin, who lived from 1509 to 1564. There were other men before him, like Augustine, that taught similar things as he did, but I'm not going to get into all the history of this, and I'm not going to, in this video, be dealing with John Calvin, although he certainly had major issues that people should know about before choosing to identify themselves with him and actually calling themselves Calvinists. For an example, John Calvin believed and taught that those he deemed as being heretics should be killed. Now, that's not a false accusation. That's history. You can look it up and, and see and do your research on it. And there's plenty of material out there that you can study uh, concerning the history of John Calvin. Uh, but that's not my point in this video. And uh, neither is it my point to deal with the broader scope of reform theology with its allegorical and non-dispensational approach to interpretation because uh, there's a lot to talk about there, and I'm trying to get to the five points of Calvinism, and I hope you'll stay with me because we will look at all five points and show how each one is not what the Word of God teaches. Uh, but they that's really the root problem, though, this approach to um, interpretation. It, it's a system of interpretation. It's it, Calvinism is, is a philosophy, and they've developed this system whereby they can read their philosophy into the Bible, but it's not sound doctrine. It's not what the Bible teaches. And so they have this allegorical method, this so-called spiritualizing, taking things that are literal and putting their own meaning on it. And by and large, Calvinists reject um, dispensationalism. Now, I realize, on the other hand, there are some dispensationalists who develop too much of a system of interpretation themselves, and they have some faulty views. But dispensation is a Bible term, and in the one verse where we're told to study the Word of God, we're told exactly how. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. All well, the Bible's a Word of Truth, but we have to acknowledge and consistently maintain in our Bible study the divisions that God put in His Word. God doesn't change in his person or in his moral principles, but he certainly has changed in his dealings with man through the ages as he has progressively revealed more truth. And uh, so when you study the Bible God's way, uh, you're a Bible believer and you allow the Bible to interpret itself and the things that are different, you leave them different. But with the Calvinist, they want to take, for an example, the nation Israel and say, well, the church today replaced Israel. We're spiritual Israel. And they take the promises God made to the nation Israel concerning a literal land and a literal kingdom on the earth, and they spiritualize that. It's not spiritual, though, to mess with the Word of God, but that's what they, 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 they so-called spiritualize it to say, well, all that's being fulfilled today spiritually in spiritual Israel. But uh, Romans 11 makes it crystal clear that God will yet save the nation Israel. And at the, at the end of Galatians 6, uh, Paul distinguishes between the true believing Israel of God and the new creature. See, the church God is building in this age is called the new creature. It's the body of Christ. It's neither Jew nor Gentile. It's one new spiritual man. It's not Israel. And during the book of Acts period, when both the believing Israel of God and the body of Christ were operating at the same time during that transition period, uh, Paul distinguishes in the same passage between the two groups, there's a difference. And uh, so, again, that's the root problem, that how they go about trying to interpret the Bible with their own system of theology. That's why when they come to a passage like Romans chapter 9, uh, they, they read themselves into it. They have a tendency to read themselves into all kinds of passages that are not about them. Um, they think everything in the Bible is aimed right at them, and every time they see the word elect, they imagine it's them. But, you know, uh, Romans 9 is not talking about individual soul salvation in the age of grace. 
Paul laid down that doctrine by inspiration of God in the first eight chapters of Romans, but Romans 9 through 11 is a parenthetical passage, and it concerns uh, uh, dispensational issues, God's dealings with Israel and the Gentiles. Romans 9 is not talking about individual soul salvation in this present age of grace. And so the point being that uh, real Calvinism and real biblical dispensationalism are mutually exclusive. I mean, if you're really a Calvinist, you're, you're going to wind up rejecting dispensationalism. And if you're a true biblical dispensationalist, you're going to wind up rejecting Calvinism. And I, again, I know there are going to be people out there who say, well, I'm a Calvinist and a dispensationalist. Well, I think you have some issues there, some confusion. Just being honest with you, uh, I'll give you a case in point. Arthur W. Pink. Uh, who wrote a number of books that people are pretty familiar with still today. Um, he, um, he, he was, at the beginning of his ministry, dispensational in how he studied the Bible, but he was also a Calvinist. Well, by the end of his ministry, uh, he wound up rejecting dispensationalism and even wrote a book against it. So that's just a case in point. But anyway, you know, the religious world is big on labels. And many think that if you are not a Calvinist, then you must be an Arminian, right? So they want to put you in one category or the other. They have to give you a label. And uh, Jacob Arminius uh, taught contrary to John Calvin. And it's interesting to study all the history of that. But I, I want to say I'm not a Calvinist nor an Arminian. Uh, Arminian taught that you could lose salvation. I believe with all my heart that a member of the body of Christ could never lose salvation. We're sealed with the Spirit, but I'm not a Calvinist. Uh, I believe in eternal security, but I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not an Arminian. And I could honestly really care less what either man taught because all I want to know is what saith the Scripture. That's the issue. The Bible's our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. I'm a Bible believer, okay? Uh, you know, in the religious world, you'll notice how there's always this, this, this issue of following a man and, and people even calling themselves after a man. I'm a Lutheran. I'm a Calvinist. I'm an Arminian. I'm a this, I'm a that. And they talk a lot about the church fathers and they seem to be impressed with men and following what men taught and what this creed says and what this council determined and blah, blah, blah. All we care about is what saith the scripture. I believe the King James Bible is the inspired and preserved words of God. That's my final authority. I try to study the Bible the way God tells me to study his Bible, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so whenever I read something or hear uh, someone teaching something, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it to the word of God and see whether it's so. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not an Arminian. I'm a Bible believer. Now, Calvinists emphasize the sovereignty of God. Uh, boy, do they emphasize it. Now, of course, God is supreme in power. He's the most high. He ruleth over all, and there's none like him. He's almighty God. He has, I mean, when you talk about the power of God and the knowledge of God and the wisdom of God, he's infinite. And we give him all glory and honor and praise. But what Calvinism teaches about the sovereignty of God and what the Bible teaches is two different things. In fact, the expression, the sovereignty of God, is actually not even in the King James Bible. Again, I understand he rules over all, that he's the most high and, and all of that. But what I'm saying is what they teach about the sovereignty of God uh, is contrary to many things with the concerning what the scripture actually says. So what they have is they have God as a puppet master who predetermines everything and controls everything. And, uh, and they think that that magnifies the power of God, but to me that belittles his power. I believe, it, I believe God is so powerful and so wise that he can give man a free will, let people make choices, not control every little detail of everything that happens, and still accomplish his purpose and plan. That's how powerful and how wise he is. And by the way, if God is in control of everything, does that not make him the author of sin? Uh, is that not fatalism to say everything is predetermined and everything is under his control? God didn't create robots. 
God gave man a free will, and Jesus Christ, for an example, in his parable concerning the Good Samaritan, he used this expression. You ready for it? He said, and Jesus, this is his teaching. I know it's a parable, but he's still teaching. There, and, and he used this expression, by chance. Find it in Luke chapter 10, verse 31. So no, no, not every detail of everything is predetermined. God's not making everything that happens happen. He's not a puppet master. He gave man a free will. So uh, Dr. Lorraine Botner in his book, and I do have a copy of it here, The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination, says that the Calvinistic system especially emphasizes five distinct doctrines. They, these are technically known as the five points of Calvinism. And they are the main pillars upon which the superstructure rests. And he gives in this book the acronym of TULIP. T, he says, stands for total inability. Now, I've all, you know, typically they say total depravity, but I've often said it's more accurate to say total inability. That's what they really mean. And he actually says that in his book. U is unconditional election. L is limited atonement, I is irresistible grace, and P is the perseverance of the saints. Now, I challenge you to get a concordance and find any of those five expressions in the Bible. There, none of those expressions, none of those five terms are, are, are there. They're not in the King James Bible. Now, the word election is there, but what they teach about it and what the Bible teaches about it is two different things. And so... Um, he says it's these are the main pillars, and their whole system rests upon it. Well, you know what? That is true. And so if the first point is wrong, and it is, the whole system crashes down because the points build upon one another. Now let's look at it. Number one, total depravity, or more accurately what they mean is total inability. And the teaching is that a sinner is so depraved that he cannot choose to believe the gospel without first being regenerated by the Holy Ghost. And so they have the order being God regenerates a sinner, then they believe the gospel because they've been regenerated. They get it backwards. They say a man is so depraved that he cannot choose to believe what God said without first being regenerated. Well, you know what? In the Old Testament, uh, you have all kinds of examples of people believing what God said that weren't regenerated because regeneration comes after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Study that out and see. Yeah, uh, lost sinners are corrupt and they can't please God in their flesh, but they can choose to believe what God said. And the Bible makes that crystal clear. The Bible refers to man's free will 17 times that word is used, free will. Okay, that's a Bible term, 17 times. And you have all kind of verses that back it up, all kind of verses. And in this video, I'm trying to cover five points here. Uh, and it took me longer than I planned to get to these five points. So I'm not, I'm not going to give you a ton of examples. I could give you many, but I'm going to give you a few references for each point. Um, in John 5, verse 40, Christ said, And ye will not come to me that you might have life. They could have come and had life, but they chose not to. And Paul said something similar in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, when he talked about um, people that will be damned because they chose uh, not to receive the love of the truth. In 2 Thessalonians 2.10, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. He goes on to say that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. They could have believed the truth. They chose not to. Okay, that's the point. Um, I mean, you know, the Bible closes with one last great invitation in Revelation 22.17. Whosoever will, let him come. Take the water of life freely. Whosoever will. You know, so you've got all kind of verses we can look at. Let me give you Acts 13, because the Calvinists would love to go to Acts 13 and read verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And so they, they read their view into that, and they make that mean that God predetermined and forced them to believe. They had to believe. 
They didn't have a choice in the matter. They were ordained, so they had to believe. Well, when you study the word ordained in the in the Bible, uh, for an example, in Psalm 7, verse 13, he hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. So ordained is to be prepared unto something, and they were prepared to eternal life by what goes on in the context here. Let's go back to verse 44. The next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they uh, were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing he put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. These Jews could have believed what Paul was preaching. They chose not to. Paul said, you're judging yourself unworthy of everlasting life. They could have received everlasting life, but they rejected it. He goes on to say, for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldst be for salvation in the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. So they had a desire to hear the word of God. Verse 44. They glorified the word of God. That's what ordained them, in other words, prepared them to eternal life because they wanted to hear the word of God and they chose to uh, believe the word of God and to glorify the word of God. They believed the gospel that was preached to them, but it was still their choice. That's the bottom line. You see, the right order uh, is Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 12. Uh, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We are regenerated by the Spirit when we believe the gospel, not before. The right order is you hear the, the gospel, you believe it, that's faith. Faith is believing what God said. When you trust Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, believing he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again, putting all your trust in his perfect and finished work, you're saved by grace through faith. It's not of works. You're trusting Christ, but it's when you believe that you're sealed with the Spirit. All right, so that's the right order in the Word of God. See, they have believing as being a work. That's what they think that if a man believes the gospel that he's done something to merit salvation. There's no merit in saying, I'm a sinner, I can't save myself, I need a Savior, I'm going to trust Christ to save me. That's not a work. In fact, Paul said in Romans 4, verse 5, To him that worketh not, but believeth, his faith is counted for righteousness. He said, worketh not, but believeth. Believing is not a work. Now, the Holy Spirit convicts, and deals with our hearts when we hear the gospel, but we got to choose to believe it. Uh, the Calvinist loves John 6, verse 44, no man can come to me except the Father draw him. But you know what? Christ also said in John 12, verse 32, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me, lifted up on the cross. Now, number two, unconditional election. What they mean by that is that before the foundation of the world, God chose a certain number of people to be saved, and therefore, obviously, the rest must be damned. And this election was not based on any condition in the people. He just simply, of his own sovereign will, decided, I'm going to save these, I'm not going to save those. Well, if, he w if there was no condition there, why wouldn't he choose to save everybody? But anyway, um, they, they say this unconditional election. Now, you have to understand, there are different elections in the Bible, okay? The, uh, elect, it means to make a choice, to choose. Uh, there are different, you can find that word elect in the Word of God, and there are different, you got to look at the context, because Christ is called the elect. He's God. He doesn't need to be saved. He's the Savior. He's the chosen Savior. They think every time they see the word elect, it's talking about salvation, there are elect angels that never fell, okay, and they can't. They couldn't be saved if they did. There is the elect nation of Israel, God's chosen nation. Then the, we in the body of Christ in this age are elect. Paul teaches because we're in Christ, and Christ is the elect. But if you study election, you're going to find it actually has to do with God's purpose in regard to service, that He has something for us to do. 
And, you know, the Calvinist loves John 15, verse 16, where uh, it, uh, Christ said, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. He's talking to the, to the apostles, his 12 apostles on the earth that he chose in his earthly ministry, and they were to serve him. And he went on to say in that verse, uh, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should bring forth fruit. He didn't say, I chose you to salvation and everybody else to damnation. No, he's talking about service. And he was talking in particular to those apostles. So, you know, I've got a message here on our channel on who are the elect. I'll put a link to it in the description below. And I show I show how election has to do with, with service. I don't have time to develop all of this right now, but I will, I will read to you from Ephesians chapter 1 because that's where the Calvinist loves to go. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And so they say, see, before the foundation of the world, you know, he chose us. Well, it says he hath chosen us in him. Now, there is a condition. In 1 Peter 1, 2, Peter said, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. God knows everything. So before the foundation of the world, he had an eternal purpose concerning the church, the body of Christ. And according to that foreknowledge, knowing who would trust Christ as Savior, he chose us in Christ, but we don't get in Christ until we believe the gospel. We weren't in Christ before the foundation of the world fell out of Christ and then got back in. No, that's not how it works. He chose us in him, key words being in him, and we get in him when we believe the gospel. And there are many verses that bear that out. And it says he chose us that we should be holy without blame before him in love. And he also uses the word predestinated. But when you study predestinated in the Bible, it is God's purpose for his people. There is nobody in the word of God that's said to be predestinated to damnation. Not at all. Predestination is for the saved, and it's got to do with God's purpose. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, see the condition there? Just like 1 Peter 1, 2. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. That's a simple word that means the destiny was determined before. In terms of pre, before, destinate, destiny, God, based on his foreknowledge, his eternal purpose in the body of, concerning the body of Christ, that those who believe the gospel will be conformed. Their destiny is, is secure. We will be conformed and glorified in the image of Christ. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. It's such a done deal. It's so secure and sure. Glorified is spoken of in the past tense. It's settled. It's done. It will happen. But the calling there, 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul said that he called you by our gospel. When we hear the gospel, the Spirit deals with our heart, shows us that we're a sinner, that we need a Savior, but we must choose to trust Christ. And when we do, we're called out of this world into the body of Christ. We're justified. We're going to be glorified. That's been predestinated. It will come to pass. But nobody's predestinated to hell. Paul said in 1 Timothy 2 that God will have all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth, and that Christ gave himself a ransom for all. Peter said in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The question comes then, well, what about the heathen? Uh, if God will have all men to be saved, how come there are people out there that, uh, that don't hear the gospel? Well, you know what? You're assuming that if everybody heard the gospel, they would all believe it. But the fact is, there are people who reject the light of conscience that they already have. And if they're not going to receive that, they're not going to receive the light of the gospel anyway. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. So it's manifest in them, in their conscience. 
For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. All men have the light of conscience and creation to know there's a creator, and he's a moral creator. Uh, that's not enough to be saved, but they need to get the gospel light. But if they reject the light of creation, uh, conscience, that basic conscience, if they reject that and they sear their conscience and they reject uh, the light of creation um, and they're not interested in knowing who God is, they're not going to believe the gospel light. And so look, uh, in the first century, through Paul's leadership, the gospel went into all the known world. Not everybody believed it. Now we want to get the gospel to everybody and we need to work to do that. But you're assuming that if everybody heard it, they would all believe it, but many reject it of their own will. So Paul said they are without excuse. Okay, I believe that if someone receives the light of conscience and creation and, and, and they're receiving that light, that more light will come their way. But they still have to choose to believe. All right, number three, limited atonement. And that's the idea that Christ only died on the cross for the elect. Um the ones that he chose arbitrarily before the foundation of the world. And uh, they say if that's not the case, then he's a failure, that he will save those he died for. And therefore, he did not die for everybody uh, without exception. But the Bible clearly says he died for all. But what the Calvinist does is he says, well, that means all without distinction, not all without exception. The elector all from all uh, cultures, Classes and creeds and colors, uh, all men with, uh, without distinction. They, they say it's not all men without exception. Well, let's look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Christ is not a failure. He died for all without exception. If people don't receive the atonement, they're the failure, not him. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Notice, then we're all dead. Let me ask you a question. Are all lost sinners dead in trespasses and sins? Separ death is a separation. There are different kinds of death mentioned in the scripture. All lost sinners are separated from the Spirit of God. Uh, they're dead in trespasses and sins, as in Ephesians 2.1. Is that true of all lost sinners without exception? Yes. All right. Well, the all were, that were dead is the same all Christ died for, according to this verse. If one died for all, then we're all dead. The same all that were dead in trespasses and sins is the all that Christ died for. And not only that, those he died for, not all of them will live. Only those that believe the gospel. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. The implication is clear that not all that he died for live, because not all, not all believe the gospel. Um, Paul said he's the savior of all men, especially them that believe. That's First Timothy four ten. Well, the, those that believe are elect in Christ, but he's the savior not only of the elect that are in Christ, but even uh, all. He said all, all. He's 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 making that distinction. Not all men, especially them that believe. So he died for all. We become elect when we elect to trust Christ as our Savior. Again, believing is not a work. We choose to trust Christ by the grace of God. He saves us, and we become elect in Christ. Now, uh, Hebrews 2.9 says that by the grace of God, Christ tasted death for every man. That's pretty clear, isn't it? First John 2, in verse 2, he's the propitiation for, uh, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so again and again and again, there are verses that make it clear that when Christ shed his blood on the cross, it was for all, and anybody can be saved who will trust Christ and receive salvation. If they don't, that's, uh, they have responsibility. There is human responsibility. I mean, the Bible is very clear on that. It's very clear on human responsibility. Um, you know, but they act like if God has a purpose and plan, that automatically count, uh, cancels out free will. God did not create robots. Man has responsibility. I'll give you a, a case in point. In Acts chapter 2, 
in Acts chapter 2 and verse number, let me find the verse I'm looking for here. And when Peter's preaching to Israel in verse number 23, and I know he's preaching Israel because that's what it says. Amen of Israel, verse 22. Verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So it was God's will that Christ died on the cross, but Israel was still responsible for killing their Messiah, and he holds them accountable and indicts them for that in this passage. So this issue of, uh, you know, the determinate counsel, the foreknowledge of God, that doesn't cancel out human responsibility. You know, so people still have a choice. That's It's very clear. There's so many verses, and I'm running out of time. I've already went longer than I intended, but... I'm telling you, folks, there are many, many verses that refute Calvinism. And so there's not a limited atonement. Number four, irresistible grace. Irresistible grace, uh, that teaching says the elect cannot resist the Holy Ghost. Well, you know, the Bible provides examples of sinners resisting the Holy Ghost. How about Acts 7, verse 51, uh, when Stephen preaching to Israel says you do always resist the Holy Ghost. <laughs> they were cut to the heart. They were convicted, but they resisted. And uh, in Acts 24, when Paul reasons with Felix uh, uh, concerning righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, he trembled. And you compare that passage to John 16 about how the Holy Spirit will come to rep reprove the world of, of, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The Holy Spirit was dealing with Felix, that's clear, as Paul gave the gospel and dealt with him um, and reasoned with him about these things that said he wanted, that, that he heard the faith in Christ and he reasoned of righteousness, uh, temperance, and judgment to come, showing God's righteous. Felix, you're not, you're anything but temperate. Uh, if you know anything about Felix and how he was, Paul was showing him he was a sinner and that therefore he deserved uh, uh, the wrath of God. And he trembled. But he said, go your way for now. I'll let you know when I have a convenient season. Uh, and there's no indication he ever got saved. Uh, he, so the Holy Ghost was obviously dealing with Felix. And, and, and look, in, in Proverbs 1, uh, it talks about how God wanting to pour out his spirit and make known his wisdom. And let me turn over there real quick. Proverbs chapter 1. Um, verse 23, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I'll pour out my spirit unto you. I'll make known my words unto you because I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. That was their choice. They resisted. They resisted. And so again, uh, the spirit of God will deal with people, but God's not going to force people to believe. He did not create robots. Man has a free will. Uh, we were made in the image of God. Uh, that volition there that free will. And so there's not an irresistible grace. Yes, we're saved by grace, but people can hear the gospel, the grace of God, and reject it. Uh, even though the Lord's dealing with them about it, they can choose to reject it, reject it, sadly. All right, lastly, the perseverance of the saints, and that's the teaching that the elect will only know that they truly are the elect if they persevere and what winds up happening is they teach that they have to prove their faith by their works and endure to the end. So uh, the perseverance of the saints, and they say, well, that's eternal security. But how about the preservation of the saints, that we are preserved, we are kept. It's not about our perseverance. It's God's faithfulness by which we're saved, not our faithfulness. But the ironic thing is the Calvinist who claims to believe in salvation by grace his system of theology leads him to ultimately believe that salvation has something to do with works because, he says, if you don't have works, you're not really elect, and you can't really know you're elect unless you prove your faith by your works and endure to the end faithfully all the way through your life. And so the Calvinist, by the time he's done and he comes full circle on his five points, he winds up agreeing more with Arminians than they want to admit. So in 2 Timothy chapter 2, our glorification is guaranteed on the basis of the faithfulness of Christ. I'm sealed with the Spirit. When you're saved in the body of Christ, you're sealed with the Spirit, and, and, and you have eternal security 
but it's not because you persevere and because you're so faithful. It's because God is faithful. In 2 Timothy 2.13, Paul said, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So even if we get deceived, and he's talking, he's warning about false doctrine in this context, if we get messed up and we get deceived, God's not going to deny himself. We're members of his body. We are secure. Verse 18, who concerning the truth of error, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So people's faith can get overthrown. They could get deceived. But if they're saved, the foundation is sure. You can't overthrow the foundation. The foundation is Christ. And we have eternal security on the basis of who he is and the salvation we have in him. The standeth, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And you know, there's many other verses. But that's looking at all five points and showing you verses in the Word of God that refute all five points. Yes, we know man is corrupt, but is he so corrupt? Is the flesh, Paul said, in my flesh dwells no good thing. Uh, we, we understand that man is corrupt, that he's a sinner, and that he, there's nothing he can do in his flesh uh, to save himself. But does that mean that he can't believe God? No, that's that's not what the Bible teaches. And we understand the, the term elect and predestinate and, and these things, but what it's the problem is what they say about it, their own definitions they put on it. That's the issue and on down the line. So these five points are not scriptural. Um, they take some Bible terms and give, give them their own faulty definitions. It's a system of theology. It's very dangerous, and the fruits of it are not good. I mean, um, I, re I realize I'm sure there's some people who love the Lord and they're sincere and they're caught up in it. But when you really look at this for what it is, it's a dead end street. It's dangerous. And I'm, I'm going to warn you, stay away from this false teaching of Calvinism. Well, there's more I'd like to say, but the time is up. And uh, if you found this to be helpful, why not give the video a thumbs up? If you haven't already subscribed to the channel. If you have a Bible question, please send us an email through our website, hopebiblechurchga.com. Thank you for watching.